You're not going to grow by studying the Bible. You are not going to grow by studying the Word. You are going to grow by abiding in the Word. Hello, welcome back to the teaching series, The Jesus That John Knew. Thank you so much for being with me again. Uh, we are now in John chapter 13, and as I said to you in the last of our teachings, you know, we really are coming now to the time where Jesus is going to, very much his public ministry is over. We saw in the last uh, teaching series, uh, this story where Philip had come very excited, uh, saying, you know, Lord, I've got these, 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 uh, these Greek people that want to meet you, and they want to hear about the gospel that you've got. And Jesus' response was, uh, Philip, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, oh, it bears much fruit. And, and poor Philip was puzzled by that mysterious statement. But there it was. And Jesus was, of course, beginning to signal for us the actual cross itself and saying, look, this is going to be of profound significance. And may I say, incidentally, that this business about unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies is something that has a very, very significant and spiritual application. Because the truth of the matter is that life springs from death. And that was something that Philip would have to grasp. And that was something that Jesus would evidence in his own death, burial and resurrection. But now we come to very much the, I think this is for me the very intimate part of John's Gospel. Uh, from chapter 13 and working all the way up through 17, 18, we're going to be really brought into the inner circle, into the inner sanctuary if you like, and we're going to hear uh, the, the, the very, very private conversations that Jesus will have with the Twelve. And we're going to see something very significant because, of course, in chapter 13, uh, we're going to see uh, Judas is going to come out from amongst the group. And that's going to change the dynamic, the spiritual dynamic. And it's also going to change the depth of the conversation that Jesus is able to enter into. Uh, and I think that's going to prove to us to be quite significant. But for the moment, let's, let's see where our scene is set. In John chapter 13 now, you'll remember, won't you, that the furore is somewhat behind them now. Um, nobody really understood the things that Jesus had been doing. They would perhaps begin to understand them somewhat more when Jesus had been glorified. But the Pharisees are in a complete turmoil, and they're in turmoil because, you know, they're, they're saying, well, this whole crowd has gone after Jesus, and where is this thing going to end? It just, it's, it's just it's going to end badly for them. That was the one thing they were pretty clear about. Now, in, in John chapter 13, then, we, we turn over to this amazing story that we all are very familiar with. Uh, and, but I want to perhaps just, you know, walk up through the story with you one more time and perhaps show you some things that may not have been obvious to you, may not have been immediately apparent to you. Uh, in John chapter 13, then, it's the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. So here we have, then, in the verse, first verse, uh, now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, oh, he loved them to the end. Now, let's just pause there for a moment, because, of course, John has set the, the scene within a particular spiritual context. It's a context that we must make sure that we grab a hold of, because, of course, the Passover to the Jewish mind is, of course, a hugely significant feast. Now, we all know, don't we, that the whole picture of the Passover is a picture of what would happen at the cross. Uh, we know from the book of Exodus that when the angel came, uh, anyone who was behind the door, which had the blood on the lentil of the door post, was, was spared, was saved. And that in and of itself raises an interesting question, because what was the qualification? Uh, was it the fact that the angel would come and knock on the door and order everybody was in the, behind the doors? No, it was the case that if you were behind the blood, then you would be saved, as simple as that. And that was the only qualification, that you had to be behind the blood. So imagine, in a, in, a, in a silly example, but I think it's still a relevant example, let's imagine that someone had come to visit you one day, and there you were you in downtown Jerusalem, and a, a someone from outside of town had come, and they just happened to come inside of your house at that moment in time, then the angel would have passed over. That was the very nature of it. And that's important because it, it does, it wants to, it's a metaphor, I think, for demonstrating to us something we've got to be always mindful of. That, that salvation, we, we make a lot of this and we say, of course, we speak so much about salvation by faith. And I do understand that. But it's salvation by grace. This, this, this message of the gospel is a message of grace. 
Uh, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and I was saying, you know, be a little bit careful about that because if you look at the story of first and last Adam in there, you're going to see that uh, all men died. Uh, they were tied to the fate of Adam. And in much the same way, it seems to me that it's by fate F-A-T-E, that we're, to, we're tied to the fate of Jesus. But here we have this, this story that we're, we're going to concentrate on today. Um, it's just before the Passover. Jesus has made this lovely statement. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart. You'll have heard me talk about this time and time again throughout this series, that Jesus will constantly come back to this thing of saying, my hour has not yet come. Uh, when his mother asks him to perform a miracle or at least fix the problem in Cana, he says, woman, what has this got to do with me? My hour hasn't come. But evidently now his hour has come. And so it says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. Now watch, during the supper, now when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured out the water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Well, dare I say that Jesus himself perhaps is looking over the shoulder of Mary, seeing how Mary in her own humility has come and served Jesus, has bowed down, has been the one that has said, Master, let me wash your feet with my tears and wipe them with my hair. Now that, that scene in itself is a scene of, of, of staggering proportions. But now we have a picture of the Master himself who is the one that's going to be washing the feet. Now, three things that we've got to see because they're very important to understanding how Jesus is able to move in this because this whole thing now is going to become clear to us about why identity is so important. It's only people that don't know who they are, you know, that have to kind of take these very high positions and they're too good for this and too good for that. But look at Jesus. The first thing that John says is knowing that, he had, that the Father had given all things into his hands. So the first thing that Jesus had is Jesus had a sense of clear sense of identity. He knew the Father had given all things into his hands. He had the identity that sat alongside of that. He had the authority that had sat alongside that. He had no need to, to prove himself. I often say to people, remember when you are in the business of Christian leadership, or in fact any kind of leadership, leadership is not about proving yourselves to other people. Leadership is about expressing yourself for other people. And here Jesus, as someone who knows that the Father has given all things into his hands, is fully able just to express himself for other people. It's a very great sign of leadership, let me say. It's a very great sign of maturity when we, when we are able to express ourselves rather than try and prove and constantly seek to validate ourselves in front of other people. So Jesus knowing, number one, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. So he knew that, number one. Number two, he knew that he came from God. And number three, he knew he was going back to God. Can you see that? Jesus was free to serve, and he was free to serve because he understood the answer to life's most fundamental questions. And these questions, until we answer them, are a constant struggle within us. But number one, he knew why he was here. Number two, he knew where he was from. And number three, he knew where he was going. And those three things become the trigger, become, if you like, the trajectory. Actually, the, uh, the springboard from which Jesus can now move into his moment, move into his hour. He knew why he was here. I wonder to myself sometimes, do we, do we understand why we're here? Are we clear about that? I think sometimes Christians over, over make the case for purpose, but I'll tell you something, there is something important about understanding why we're here. Do we under, understand where we're from? I don't mean in my case I'm from London or in your case you're from New York or whatever else it might be. 
Do you know where you're from? We are, we are, the scripture tells us, we are heavenly people, born from above. Do you know where you're going to? My friend, you're, where you're going to is secure and settled. Your destination has been secured. But the issue that we're really interested in is not whether your destination has been secured, it's whether your destiny will be fulfilled. We all know you're going to go to heaven when you leave the earth. The question is, will heaven, will heaven come down on the earth while you're still here? That's the thing we're really trying to ask about. That's the thing we want to know. We all know there's going to be life after death. We understand that. But the question is, could there be, could there be life before? Or death and the only way that's going to happen is if you're prepared to die before you die and see here you see exactly what Paul saw when Paul was looking and thinking about Jesus and said to him he he's somebody who didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped but just emptied himself taking on the form of a bond servant and now here we see him as that bond servant he's the teacher he's the master and yet what a paradoxical master he is one that is able to, to be free to serve others and I tell you something this is a lesson and we're going to have to learn and it's a lesson we're going to have to learn in 21st century corporate England and 21st century corporate America because it's a most important principle for us to grasp you see people what we're really looking for now is we're looking for what Jesus modeled exactly what he was modeling which we just call servant leadership but yet there's so little of it about there's so few people that are willing to just humble themselves and serve and may I say being humble and it doesn't and humility doesn't mean you think less of yourself that's not what humility means humility means that you think of yourself less oh it's a big person that can serve and here we see Jesus just so effortlessly just so self of self deprecatingly the Bible says in the fourth verse he rose from the supper and he laid aside his outer garments I mean here is Jesus he's the master I mean please get your brain around this Think about your leaders, your political leaders. Think about your church leaders. Think about your business leaders. This guy just lays aside his outer garments. In other words, for you and I, so much of our outer garments, our uniforms validates us. Look at me, I've got a badge. Look at me, I've got a yellow badge that says I'm in the ministry team. Look at me, I've got a car that says I'm so-and-so. Look at me, I'm the sheriff. Look at me, I've got a uniform. Look at me, I've got some kind of status. And Jesus just lays aside his outer garments. And he literally is standing there in his underwear, for goodness sake. And he takes a towel and he wraps it around his waist and then he pours out this basin of water and, uh, and begins to wash the feet of his disciples and then what and then he uses the towel that he's wrapped around him to wash their feet can you just take a moment to think about what that looks like can you just take a moment to readjust your brain to say what on earth is this what kind of a leader is this well, it's a paradigm shift. It's a shift that's taking you away from a leadership where you have the leader at the top to where you understand that the leader is really at the bottom. The leader is the one who's the servant of all. The leader isn't the one that serves all. The leader is the one that serves all. He's, he's important. He's not the one that gets served. He's the one that does the serving. Ah, Peter just said, what are you, crazy? Because Peter's been in church. Peter understands that in church life it's not like this. The guy who's the holy guy sits on the holy chairs and he sits at the top and he looks down on the congregation and they bow and scrape and fall over the place when he comes in. And Peter says, what are you, insane? You want to wash my feet? Peter says, forget that. You're not washing my feet. And Jesus says, Peter, what I'm doing you don't understand. I get that you don't understand that, but afterwards you'll understand. Your, your moment's coming, Peter. It's coming down the track. Don't worry, that's coming pretty soon. Uh, Luke will tell you about that. Well, when we get down to the end of this text, we'll see, oh my goodness, it comes to Peter in a hurry when the Lord says to Peter, Peter, let me tell you something. Satan has asked to sift you, but I've prayed for you. And once you're restored, encourage the brothers. Be their servant. You see, this is the Last Supper. This is a picture for us of the, as how Jesus takes the Last Supper and celebrates that for them. Do you remember what you read when you, you go through this ritual Sunday by Sunday by Sunday, but do you ever hear what Jesus is really saying? Jesus is saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And what do we do? We take little bits of bread or little bits of wafer and we break it in half and we pass it to one another and say, so this is his body, it's broken for you. No, what he's saying is, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do what? 
be broken. Understand that we are the body of Christ, those who are broken for him. That's the whole point. And then he says, this is the blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. And he says to us, now one of you, do likewise. When you're together, do this. Do what? Well, be poured out for one another. Be poured out for one another. And the picture of the leadership, the picture of Christian leadership, of the spiritual leader, never mind that, the spiritual leader, the corporate leader, is someone who is broken and poured out for others. Uh, but for Peter, this is too much because Peter has a Christian management framework in his mind who understands that you have a manager and a hierarchy and you have worker bees and we're kind of down here and the manager says jump and we says how high. And, but, but that's not it. Yeah, that's in his mind, a, a, a model where it says, uh, you know, it's a management model. It's a hierarchical model. It's an industrial age model. But my friend, that is not the model that will, subs will, will survive into the 21st century. And it certainly wasn't the model that Jesus modeled back here in, 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 in New Testament times. And he simply says to him, Peter, you don't understand what I'm doing, but afterwards you'll understand. But Peter said to him, I'm sorry, it's out of the question. You will never wash my feet. And Jesus says, well, if I can't wash your feet, you can have no share with me. Maybe that's a, a nice place to kind of stop for a moment because Sometimes we rush through so much of the teaching and we don't take enough time to pause. But can you imagine that? Jesus is saying, Jesus, Jesus Christ is saying, if I can't serve you, if I can't wash your feet, you can have no part of me. Because we're bonded together as servants. I came to serve, Jesus says. What is your pleasure? Oh, my friends, if we would understand in the Christian leadership in the 21st century that we are called to serve one another in love. We've been freed to serve. <laughs> what a simple, simple message. And Paul Peter is completely disorientated by this. Desperate to, to, to want Jesus to, to, to be a part of Jesus. No, no, well then watch me all. Watch all of me. And the Lord says, Billy, you're not really getting this, are you? Bless you. Understand that this, this task of washing someone's feet is perhaps the most demeaning thing that anybody could ever do. It is the, most, it's the lowest ranking thing a servant could ever be asked to do in a household. But yet this is precisely the role that Jesus takes. They're all gathered together and none of the disciples offers to wash Jesus' feet. None of the disciples offer to wash one another's feet. Hmm. <laughs> Because perhaps they are always caught up in their argument. Who's the greatest? Who's the best? And Jesus shows them who the greatest of all is. The one who serves. I encourage you just to think on that in this week that lies ahead. And I look forward to taking you on in this teaching when we come back next time. But in the meantime, God bless you. And don't be afraid to serve. It is a genuine, genuine hallmark of greatness. God bless you. Bye-bye. Let me just tee the problem up a bit more for you by saying the real issue has to do with Paul's credentials. Uh, you see, the problem that Paul is up against is this is that he's going to bring a controversial message to a group of people and the disadvantage that Paul is apparently at is that he has a controversial past. How many of you understand what it means to have a controversial past where perhaps you may lack credibility in certain circumstances? Perhaps you don't have the letters, perhaps you don't have the training, perhaps you've had a life that is not what the church people would call holy and consistent with being Christian. Perhaps you've made mistakes, perhaps you've been divorced, perhaps you've had an abortion, perhaps you've been a this or perhaps you've been a that. And somehow you feel that you are disqualified from being able to stand up and say what it is you believe. And maybe that past life keeps you from moving into your destiny. And so you're held back by your past from being in your very present moment. Does anybody understand what I might be talking about? And this is very important because there are so many people that are suppressed and oppressed and repressed and depressed because of their past. But how many of you know that all things...